طيب السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. I can get everyone's attention inshallah we're going to be starting our lesson today and we are going to have to wrap up a bit early because uh, we do have classes uh, immediately after this class so inshallah we'll try and be very time conscious today inshallah without any further delay let's let's go over some of the stuff that we had covered yesterday and this is something that we're going to be doing every lesson inshallah so that we are connected with the material and at the same time we develop a good comprehension of the material as well. So that being said, we had first covered angels. And in respect to the angels, we had covered things like their origin, exactly what they're made from, we what their position is by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, making it clear that they're not the daughters of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rather they are the noble servants, and their function is to do as they're told. They have been given certain duties and they will continue to do, do those duties so long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has assigned that for them. How many there are, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. There is something that um, uh, one hadith that had come to mind was that upon the Kaaba, there is on the seventh sky a place called Baytul Ma'mur. Okay, it's it's uh, immediately above the Kaaba on the seventh sky, and that's where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had met had met Ibrahim alaihi salatu wasallam in the night of Miraj. And that place, according to the ahadith, seventy thousand angels search circumambulate they do tawaf of that place every day. Seventy thousand, and once they get a turn, they will never get a turn again. Okay. Now you do the math. How many angels are there in existence? Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. I mean, there's a tremendous amount. And that's why that only goes to show that six billion humans, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not really in need of us. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just giving us an opportunity for us to gain something that He has offered. We had also covered scriptures yesterday. In respect to the scriptures, we had covered the nature and its types. In other words, when we talk about the nature, we're um, focusing on its origins, its authenticity, the numbers. We discussed that in detail. We also had dispelled the myth that many of us normally uh, have um, basically believed in, which is the Bible is the Injil. So the Bible is not the Injil which was revealed to Isa alayhi salatu was salam. Uh, did anyone get a chance to watch that video which I had uh, told you about who wrote the Bible? What were your thoughts on it? Sorry? Well, the one I saw, it was all in, it was on Google videos, so they didn't break it up in segments. All right, okay. Guy from Britain that had gone. Yeah, so what were your thoughts? It's very interesting. I mean, what I admired about him is his zeal to actually go to those places and, you know, try and do an assessment for himself. Investigation, right? And that's something that is also encouraged in us as well, that we investigate. And we had also concluded with the Qur'an, we talked about its authenticity, its challenge. We spoke about the purpose of this book, the sequence of revelation, and our duties towards it. And the ultimate duty toward it, towards it is to practice it. Because if you really want salvation, this is the only way to gain it. You just do as you're told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so these are some of the key points that we had gone over. Yes? See, we really won't know with certainty. Uh, there are copies of the English Torah. However, it's not the complete thing. And until today, when you go into synagogues, the the trend is that the they have this special type of casing, okay, with the actual scripture inside. And it's not accessible to all. Okay, it's only accessible to the privileged few. Right? So we will never know with, uh, what do you call it, uh, true certainty being a Muslim, 
exactly how much of it is is in public circulation and how much is not. Wallahu alam. Because even the Jews, they don't know. Allah Himself, He says, وَمِنْهُمْ أُمِّيُّونَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ الْكِتَابَ إِلَّا أَمَانِيَّ وَإِنْهُمْ إِلَّا يَظُنُّونَ He's saying about the Jewish people, that amongst them are those who are illiterate, أُمِّيُّونَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ الْكِتَابَ They don't know anything about the scripture. إِلَّا الْأَمَانِيَّ And all they have is big aspirations and big hopes, and they are just dwelling on assumptions. وَهُمْ يَظُنُّونَ And it's not really their fault. It's because of their leaders haven't given them that direction. They haven't fulfilled the covenant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Okay? So let's move on to our lesson. Today we have some really important things to discuss, inshallah. The first is belief in the messengers. Page 10 in your workbook. And remember, we're following the sequence of the hadith that we had gone over yesterday. Right, where Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has defined iman. So the next thing on the list is the messengers. Okay, now in respect to the messengers, we find the first and foremost thing is that they are honored and ennobled human beings. They have been people whose status is elevated, and that one point that's there. Okay, this point right here, human beings. Is something that we're going to focus on today. Okay? And that's simply because there are factions in our community who have other thoughts about the Anbiya alayhim salatu wasalam as to what they are, what their nature is, and so forth. So, we find in the book, it says, Messengers are human beings who have been honored by Allah to convey His message to humanity. And there is no bigger honor than this. Okay? This is... You can say the pinnacle of respect, honor, and dignity in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you have been chosen to convey His message. There's nothing greater than this. I mean, the connection a person has with Allah at that point surpasses any other connection in existence. Okay? And the other thing that we also have to come to terms with is that the Anbiya alayhim salatu wasalam are not people who work for that position. Okay? It's not something, that position of prophethood is not something that you will develop over time. That you work very hard in your worship and your in your ibadah and finally you will be privileged. That's not the case. These are people who are being hand selected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, it's a designation that He gives to whoever He likes. It's not something that you work for. Just like when you're in a company. Okay, you can start off with customer service and work your way up to the CEO. And there are people in many corporations like that. They started from the front lines and ended up being becoming, you know, the heads of those huge companies. You work your way up the ladder. That's not the case with prophethood. You don't work your way up to prophethood. Okay? It's a designation that Allah gives to whoever He likes and those people have already been fixed from before. Okay, so when it comes to the prophets alayhim salatu wasalam, we have asserted that there are human beings that they have been honored to by Allah to convey His message. And this is because Allah Himself says, Tilka Rusulu, so their, their messengers said to them, Qalat lahum rusuluhum, in nahnu illa basharu mithlukum. Their messengers said to them, we're only human like you. Okay, this is coming from their own mouths. They're not saying that we are supermen. They're not saying that we are mystical figures. They're not saying that we are supernatural figures. No, we are humans just like you. In nahnu illa basharu mithlukum, walakin Allah yamunu ala min yasha'u min ibadi. And then it says here, but Allah confers favor upon whom He wills of His servants. And when it comes to the favors of Allah, remember one thing: we are in no position to demand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does a favor for me just like he did a favor for that person. Okay? ذَلِكَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ يُؤْتِيهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ That is the favor and the grace of Allah. He gives it to whoever he likes. Okay? So we are in no position to demand from Allah, you got to do this for me because you did that for him. An example of this we see with this very nation. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gives an example, and I'm paraphrasing the hadith. He gives an example of all three monotheistic communities. 
the Jews, the Christians, and us, the Muslims. And he tells, he gives an example of how a person is hired for some labor work, and after an, uh, a deal is struck with them, that you will be compensated this much, and they do their shift, right, from basically, if I am correct, it's like from Fajr to Bohar, and then the next group comes of laborers, they strike a deal with the person who's hired him, and then they do their work from Doha to Asa, and then after that comes another group. And they do their work from Asa to Maghrib, and they're compensated double. And the previous two groups, or individuals, I'm not, I can't remember it vividly, but they start protesting, oh, wait a second, we work longer hours and double the time that those people, uh, what do you call it, had uh, worked, yet we got compensated this much and they co were compensated even more. So what's the case with that? So they're demanding that basically they are treated the same way in terms of compensation. So the person who's, put the, who's hired them, he asked them that, wait a second, what we had agreed with you, did we shortchange you in any way? The answer is no. Whatever deal was made, you have been compensated accordingly. But when it comes to the, those people, he just wanted to favor them. He just wanted to give them more than they deserve. And that's totally up to him what he wants to do. As long as he has not done injustice to anyone, he has whatever he has promised, he has delivered. But when it comes to giving a favor to another person, that's totally up to him. Giving him more than he deserves. And that is the position of us compared to the previous generations. They have li lived longer lives, and we're living a shorter span of life. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is favoring us so much that for one deed, He's compensating us by ten times at the bare minimum, and it can go up to hundreds and thousands of times. It's totally up to Allah. So when it comes to the messengers, right? This is a favor from Allah. He gives it to whoever He likes. Okay, and that is His authority. And we also think the same about ourselves. If I want to do a favor for someone, then who is another person to make demands on me? And the same thing, it says here, say, I am only a man like you. This is being told to the Prophet That you say, okay, that I am only human like you. إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ some of the injustices which have been done in the translation, and I, I, I'm very disturbed by it when I see it, and what happens is the general public, they, I mean, they can know less. But what happens, I've seen in certain translations of people who conform to a certain ideology, they will add here, I am only a man like you in appearance. Suratan, they add that. I've seen this with my own eyes. Okay, and that's a great injustice because this is not coming from the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is not coming from Allah. This is coming from a certain ideology, a certain philosophy. And you're adding that in. Now the common person will know, he won't know any better and he's going to be beguiled by that. But it's a great injustice that is. Okay, so they are normal human beings. They have had a similar process of coming into this world just like we have with the exception of Adam alayhi salatu wasalam and Isa alayhi salatu wasalam they're the only exceptions apart from that everyone has gone through the same process but what has made them so special it's this message it's this designation it's this responsibility that's what's made them so special and then what is that message it says there okay that to whom has been revealed, Yuha ilayya annama ilahukum ilahu wahid. Your Lord is only one Lord. Your God is only one God. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, and then the message is after Faman Gani Raju Dika Arabi Fanya Amana Amanan Saliha. These are the final verses of Surah Al Kahf. So whoever hopes to meet with his Lord, then let him do righteous work. Now this is in terms of um what do you call it? Their their position. What is their? What are their duties? So when it comes to the duties, it says there they have been sent as conveyors of glad tidings to the righteous and as warners for the wicked. 
So basically, as I've repeatedly said previously, they are the mailmen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has given them a message, they are supposed to convey the message. Those who obey the message, adopt it, believe in it, their duty is to give them the glad tidings of paradise. That you listened, you obeyed, this is what is in store for you. Those people who disobeyed, who did not want to believe, then the Prophet's duty is to warn them that, look, you have chosen this route in life, this is exactly the decision you have made, and these are now going to be the consequences. And historically, there have always been more disbelievers than believers. And that's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also told us. The vast majority of people, even though you're eager, will not be believers. They're not coming from me. Allah Himself says that. And He's saying that to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You're not asking them for any, uh, what do you call it, compensation or there's no membership fees to enter into Islam. Okay, this is only the scripture which has come. It's only a reminder, okay, for those who are in the world. Okay, so this is the, this is the duty of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And now that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that, that in itself should put us in a right frame of mind where some of us feel we have the obligation to convince people that Islam is the truth and Islam is authentic and so forth. You don't have that obligation. And as soon as you uh, you continue with that mindset, that's when you start getting into some really gray areas. Because you're trying to convince a person about its, Islam's authenticity based on that person's standards. That person is not willing to come to this standard, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to compromise Islam so it goes according to this person's standards. And that's when we get into some really, really messy areas. Okay, so... Uh, you want to come, that's reserved for the sisters, inshallah. Come to the floor, to the front, there's plenty of space, inshallah. Okay, so the, this is the duty of the Anbiya, alayhi wa salatu wa salam. Also, we find that these people are the models of humanity. They are rightly guided individuals. Okay, there are people who have been aided and assisted by Allah, guided by Allah. Okay, they are flawless in their spirituality. Okay, they are flawless in their spirituality. They are the pinnacle of human excellence in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the people who we are supposed to take up as role models. No, we're not going to take up the Bollywood stars and the Hollywood stars and the MTV stars and the sports stars as our models. No, we are going to take them. If we want to be a good believer in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's the way you do it. You follow those individuals. And this is something that we really, really need to try and convince our generations about. Because they are so overwhelmed with all this media uh, exposure of different individuals right? and it's only human nature the more you get exposed to something the more you become inclined towards it the more you develop love for it because there is minimum exposure to the Anbiya some almost none I mean as soon as a child starts getting some senses what, what do we normally do unfortunately in this culture of ours in this society we either put on Looney Tunes Walt Disney films Okay, and me stuff. You know, I'm not sure about the latest cartoons. I'm totally out of touch, unfortunately. I don't know if it's fortunate or unfortunate, but I am too, quite out of touch. Okay, so, but basically, when we were growing up, what was it that we're watching? We're watching all these Marvel type of cartoons, DC cartoons, whether it be Batman, Superman, or whatever. And you, and you aspire to be like them. Okay, I remember when I, when I was a kid, I was a huge comic collector. And I just love Spider-Man for some reason, okay? And I used, to, I used to think at nighttime before going to sleep that when am I going to get the opportunity to get a Spider-Man costume and I'm going to go and beat up some criminals. And But there's not a lot of uh, huge buildings here in Brampton, so I don't know how I'm going to be a web slinger, okay? But this is what you think about, right? Because all you do is that's what you're reading, that's what you're getting exposed to, and that's what you're influenced by. So our children today, unfortunately, 
have almost no connection with the Anbiya alayhimu salatu wasalam, so how are they going to aspire to be like them? They don't even know who Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is. I remember one child, I was, um, I went to this house when I was in England. I was invited over for dinner. And because they're also very close family friends, uh, I went upstairs into the room to pray my asr salah. And after asr, uh, the, the, there was a child who was only seven years old. And in his room, in those days, Power Rangers were huge. Okay, so... Everything you see in his room is Power Rangers, Power Ranger, poster, Power Ranger, toys, Power Ranger, you name it, Power Ranger. Okay? So then I asked it, I asked him that, uh, son, who do you pray to? You know, when we're praying Salah, you, you just join me. And mashallah, he was very ambitious. And he goes, uh, well, I pray to the Moli Sahib. Okay? He doesn't even know who Allah is. He doesn't even know who he's praying to. He was just copying some movements which I'm doing, and he's seven years old. Okay, and that's the time when they're supposed to be trained for salah, as per the instructions of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But he doesn't know anything. And th the most disturbing part is when what happens is when topics like this come up in front of our parents, they say, "Don't teach that stuff to our children. They're too young." Okay, they're too young to know about Allah. They're too young to know about the Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi They're too young to know about the Anbiya alayhi wasallam. But they're not young enough to know about Tom and Jerry. Okay, you know they have to know about Tom and Jerry, Mickey Mouse, and Winnie the Pooh, and whatever's out there. Okay, this is one of the biggest mistakes that we make. And then what happens when they grow up having no love for Islam and do things which all of a sudden are coming to our doorstep? Then we go to the Mu'lana for Thames. Okay, the Mu'lana gives us a piece of paper. So, you know, we'll have this Harry Potter type of experience, okay, that everything will be okay. We'd be so unrealistic with our deen, unfortunately. So these are the people that we're supposed to follow. The Anbiya alayhi wasalatu wasalam, and alhamdulillah, they're people who are doing a lot of good work. They're, I mean, in the last 10 years, so many different books have been released, you know, ch children type of books. You know, there's one publisher, I'm sure you've heard of it, Good Works. Uh, good work books, they've done a tremendous amount of uh, you know, effort, mashallah, making children books, talking about the stories of the Anbiya, stories from the Quran, stories related to Allah, stories about paradise, mashallah, tremendous amount of work they've done. They, they fill the void that was highly needed in our community. So, alhamdulillah, good work is being done. And that's the name that they've given us, so good work. So, alhamdulillah, you have to give credit where it's due. So, what we, what my personal advice would be for those of us who have children, you know, get them exposed to the right things before the other things, which will brainwash them and take them away from the Sirat al Mustaqim. And we ourselves, we also make the effort to try and get connected with these individuals, the Anbiya alayhim wa salatu wa So that being said, look, now when we say that they are righteous and they are guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is their guidance that we must follow and their direction we must obey. We have these verses here uh, from Surah Al-An'am. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself is saying that he, he lists all the Anbiya alayhi wa salatu wasalam's names and he tells how he has favored them, how he has preferred them over the worlds, how they have been guided to the straight path. And at the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those are the ones whom Allah has guided. So from their guidance, take an example. Okay? Allah himself is telling us. These are the people we are supposed to follow. Okay, that's the final verse of um, the first ver uh, the the first set of verses which I have cited there. And at the same time, and we did not send any messenger except to be obeyed by the permission of Allah. What is the whole purpose of sending a messenger? So that they are followed, they are obeyed. Whatever it is that they demonstrate to us, we will adopt. Okay, that is the whole purpose of sending a messenger. The messenger is also the instructor. Just like when we are going to go have, uh, when we want to learn how to drive. We don't just suffice with the manual. Okay, we don't suffice with those books which have been written on G1, G2, and G. But what we do is we also get an instructor to train us how to drive. Is that correct or incorrect? Right? We get an instructor to train us how to drive. So it's not just about reading the book. 
We have theory and now we need a practical demonstration. That's what the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam are there for. They give you a practical demonstration as to how to go about following the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so these are the people, as I'm going to stress over and over again, who we have to follow if we truly want success. If we're going to look for any other alternative, any other role model, as we normally do, and think that this is what's going to grant us success, and we have to define success as well. I mean, if it's material success, if it's success in position and power, it's a different story. We look upon different types of people. But if you want the true success, the success of passing the test of life, the success of going straight into Jannatul Firdaus, insha'Allah, then these are the people we have to follow. Okay, it's as simple as that. Now, it's very easy for a person to come and say, I'm a prophet. We have people at this time as well, okay, that go around saying that they are prophets. We have one sitting in Utah. Okay, you have people within the last hundred years who have claimed prophethood, and it's it's something which is continuous. And it's very easy for me to come and say, well, I'm a prophet. However, what is the proof? Okay, anyone can make a claim. I can say I'm the CEO of Apple, even though we don't we know that's not the case. I'm not Steve Jobs. Okay, I can claim that, but what's my proof? We know that every claim is baseless unless it's substantiated by some evidence. So say for example, if I work for a company, what my proof would be, I have a special badge or some ID or a card, this is my proof that I work for this company. Okay? Now, when it comes to the Anbiya alayhim salatu when they go to their communities and say that they have a message from Allah, that they are people who have been blessed with prophethood, and they are now the guides of the community, well, how do they prove that claim? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what He does, is He blesses them with miracles. And He normally blesses them with miracles which are needed to defy the notions, the incorrect notions that they conform by. Okay, so whatever is the trend of the time, whatever has been, uh, whatever has uh, caused fitna in the community and has been the source of fitna and pe throwing people off the Sirat al Mustaqim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you see a trend that He blesses the prophets with a miracle which defies all of that. For example, you see with Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. In Musa alayhi salatu wasalam's time, black magic that was, that was huge. Okay, everyone was into magic and the people who had influence in society were magicians. So what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give to the Prophet Musa alayhi salatu wasalam? Something that was totally beyond the rules of magic. And that was proven when there was a showdown between Musa alayhi salatu wasalam and all the great magicians of the land. When they saw Musa alayhi salatu wasalam's miracle, okay, which was the staff, you just threw it and it turns into a serpent, it turns into a snake, and it ate up everything that they had brought because all they had brought was illusions. They were the David Copperfields of their days or the Chris Angels. Okay, so what they're doing is they are fooling people, they're just creating illusions, but when they saw Musa alayhi staff turn into a snake, they knew this was the real thing. This is not an illusion. And because they were so influenced and so intimidated by what they had seen, they were ulqiya saharatu sajideen. Allah uses the words, they were thrown into sajda. Okay, they were so put in awe from what they had saw, they had gone straight into sajda, and they said, Amanna bi rabbil alameen. Okay, we have brought faith in the Lord of all the worlds. And just to clarify, with that doesn't mean Fir'aun, Rabbi Musa wa Harun, we're talking about the Lord of Musa and Harun alayhi salatu Okay, so, with Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. In his time, in that area, according to what the historians write, the medicine had made a tremendous advancement in their society. Okay, and that was what they were uh, really into. That was basically as today, science ha has become something which is a major influencer of society. So, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do to defy all their iman in, in medicine? He gives Isa alayhi salatu wasalam a miraculous birth. Okay, which is totally defies all the laws and the codes that they have made. It's impossible. 
with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa we talked about this yesterday. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was given the Qur'an. The Arabs, they were very boastful and arrogant about their language. Okay, and they called the rest of us ajam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them a scripture which totally, you know, it, it just baffles them. And it destroys their faith in what it is that they believe in and is, that is taking them away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does. He gives them miracles and this is proof that they are the genuine messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so each messenger provided clear proofs for the authenticity of their message through miracles which Allah bestowed upon them. They did not possess the ability, however, to produce signs and miracles of their own. The Anbiya alayhi wa salatu were not entertainers. Okay, they would not come and just pull out a miracle on their own and just display it. Whatever miracle Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them, that is what they would display. If they wanted to create a miracle, another miracle of their own, that's something they couldn't do. They were powerless in that regards. And you will find that the communities would make different demands. Look, the Prophet ﷺ, they made a huge demands, the Quraysh, okay, where they, what is the verse now? And it's, it's in Surah Bani Israel, uh, أَوْ تَكُونَ لَكَ جَنَّةٌ مِّنْ نَخِيلٍ وَعِنَبٍ فَتُفَجِّرَ الْأَنْهَارَ خِلَالَهَا تَفْجِيرًا أَوْ تُسْتِكَ السَّمَاءَ فِي سَفًا They're making all these claims that we will only believe in you if you turn these lands into, into uh, what do you call it, gardens and you have rivers flowing in between or you make a piece of the sky coming down or, or you go to the sky and bring a new book. All these irrational claims are, or irrational demands they're making to the Prophet and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is being told by Allah Qul, Subhana Rabbi hal kuntu illa bashara rasula Say, respond to them like this, Subhana Rabbi, glory to my Lord, Qul Subhana Rabbi hal kuntu illa bashara rasula I'm only a human and a messenger. That's all I am. I'm not here to put on a show. This is not Broadway and this is not Hollywood. Okay, I'm not here to put on a show. So basically, and even at times when they were continuously making these demands and the Prophet wasallam, obviously he was disturbed by a lot of things he's disturbed by you know the rejection that he's getting he's disturbed by all the taunt taunts that he is getting uh, and also you'll find that the Prophet wasallam, one of his attributes is harisun alaykum he was very eager over people and what was he eager over? their iman because he knows the consequences of not adopting the iman so he is very eager. And one of the things that he also aspired was that why if these demands were filled, maybe they would come into Islam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Quran, وَإِن كَانَ كَبْرُ عَلَيْكَ إِعْرَاضُهُمْ فَإِنِ اسْتَطَعَكَ أَن تَبَتَغِيَ نَفَقًا فِي الْأَرْضِ أَوْ سُلَّمًا فِي السَّمَاءِ فَتَأْتِيَهُمْ بِآيَةٌ وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَجَمَعَهُمْ عَلَى الْهُدَى فَلَا تَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْجَاهِلِينَ Allah tells to the tells the Prophet Sallallahu directly that if they're turning away from the faith is becoming so hard upon you. If you are able to find a hole in the ground or a staircase to the sky and bring a, a sign to them, then go ahead, bring a sign. Allah is telling this to the Prophet Sallallahu If you can do that, then go ahead, do it. Right? If Allah wants, He can He can gather them all on guidance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if He wants to give guidance to the whole of humanity, He can do it in an instant. Okay? But then the purpose of life is defeated. Where is the exam now? Okay, so Allah says, Allah wants, He can gather them and collect them all on guidance. And He tells the Prophet sallallahu do not become amongst the ignorant. So the point I'm trying to make is the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam, they do not have the ability to produce miracles on their own independent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power. So they will only produce whatever Allah has blessed them with. Okay? And that is important to know because what happens is some, uh, some factions in our community, they totally focus just on the miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasalam, and as a result, he is portrayed as some mystical figure. 
And that's where we are now going and exceeding the boundaries. Okay, so if we were acquainted with this, then we wouldn't be able, we wouldn't be doing that. So the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam, they produce miracles as proof, as an argument against those who uh, who defy them and who deny them. And they will only produce what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed them with. Independent from Allah, they, can do, they cannot do anything. And some messengers have been given superiority to others. So all the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam are not of the same rank. Some are more superior to others, as Allah Himself says, "Tilka rusulu fadlna ba'dahum ala ba." These are the messengers we have given superiority to some over others. Min hum man kallam Allah wa rafaa ba'dahum darajat. Amongst them are those who Allah has directly spoken to, like Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, and He has raised some in status. So the highest of them is our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, His honor, okay, and His position manifested and it was shown on the night of Mi'raj when the Prophet Sallallahu led all the Anbiya Alayhi Salatu in prayer. It showed that he is the Imam of all of them. Okay, so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's position is the highest position. And then you have different ranks within the Anbiya Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, which that, that is a designation that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gives. He can give a rank to whoever he likes. Okay, so there are those who are higher than others. Some of the prophets which are most noted are like Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, and our prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam. Just to make one thing uh, a bit more clear as to how, uh, which nations came to, or I should say which prophets came to what nation. You, know, you have a chain obviously of uh, of lineage we, our origins start from Adam alayhi salatu wasalam and as time goes by the first prophet that came with sharia okay which came with islamic law was Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam prior to that uh, historians write that the anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam that would come they would come to teach people how to live on a day to day basis teach them trade teach them a whole bunch of things how to function and initially everyone was a muwahid, everyone was a, was a monotheistic, was a monotheist, okay, they were obeying Allah. But slowly idol worship was introduced and that's in, that in itself is very interesting, the story of how it was introduced, you know, from revering saints by making pictures of them and statues of them, but then the reverence, it took a totally different form and shape and it turned into worship. And then after that, the first prophet to come to call people away from shirk was Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam. People were destroyed in the flood, and he had three sons, Sam, Ham, and Yaqub. And it is from them the progeny of all of us, okay, it, it had expanded. So going down now, you had one of one person which comes in that progeny, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam had two sons. His first son is Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam. 13 years later, he was blessed with another son, Ishaq alayhi salatu wasalam. The mothers are different. Okay, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam had Ismail through Hajar alayhi salatu wasalam. And he had his second son from his uh, original wife, Sarah alayhi salatu wasalam. And uh, that was Ishaq. So, Hajar and Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam were relocated in Mecca. And there was a Yemeni tribe that was, or I should say Yemeni caravan that was coming up and they were going to Sham because Sham was the business hub of the Middle East in those days. And some of them decided to stay in Mecca because there was water there, Zamzam. Uh, that in itself, some of us may know the story of its origins and if we don't, we'll cover it some other time. So now, they lodged here because having water is very essential in the desert where it only rains once or twice a year if you're lucky. Okay, that's why you'd have wars just over a well. Okay, we don't understand the value of water because we have it in such abundance here. And it's for us, we just have to turn on a tap and we have you know, as much water as we want gushing out. That's not the case in those lands. And we know without water, we can't survive. So they lodged there, Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam married into these people and a new community was born. And from that community, 570 years after Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, was uplifted from this world in the ascension 
the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes. So in Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam's progeny, no prophets came except for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But on the other side, Ishaq alayhi salatu wasalam, as I had gone over this yesterday, he had one son, uh, which was Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam. Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam had 12 sons. Amongst them was Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, another prophet. And from their, in their generations, all these great prophets such as Dawood alayhi salatu wasalam, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, Sulaiman, Harun, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, all these great prophets came in that progeny, in that line, and their duty was to approach the people of the children of Israel. When we say the children of Israel, we're talking about the children of Yaqub. Israel is another name of Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam. Isra means slave and il means Allah. Okay, so Israel, he is the slave of Allah. They are the children of Israel. Okay, the children of Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam. That's just to give you a, a better picture, okay, of who came where and who was sent where. I did. I do have a diagram of this. I'll post it up on our forum, inshallah. It's in another uh, PowerPoint. Normally, I show this to uh, these uh, we call Christian, the Catholic schools, which come over to our masjid. When we do a presentation, we show them this whole uh, what do you call it? this uh, this chart. And as for the exact number of the messengers, we don't know with certainty how many of them have come. Amongst them are those who have, we have related to you, their stories, and there are some who we have not related to. So the exact number is not known with certainty. There are conflicting reports. Some reports say there's been 124,000. Some say there's been 240,000. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Our position is... We do not make any distinction between the Anbiya in terms of believing in some and rejecting others. No. We believe in all of them. All of them came with the same message. All of them came for the same purpose. And we believe in all. To reject one is to reject all. Okay? So we believe in all of them. How many there were? Only Allah knows. I and mean, it's not necessary for us to investigate. It's not one of the things Allah is going to ask us on the Day of Judgment. Do you know how many prophets I sent? No, He's not going to ask us that. So there's no need for us to really focus on that. So this is in respect to the messengers, our belief, our general belief uh, in respect to them. Now before we move on, I'm going to ask some of us to share what we believe about Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's going to be the final section of our uh, of this session here. We're going to talk about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in detail. But before you turn the page, stick on uh, page ten. Go, don't go to page eleven right now. Stick there, and I'd like to hear from the floor any person in the next five minutes. Or well, not even five. Let's cut it down to two because of uh, restriction in time. The limitations in time. If anyone would like to stand up and tell me what their belief in Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is. Don't feel shy, inshallah. Feel free to express yourselves. And I'm, I'm not going to mark you on this. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
One more person. Would anyone like to add on to that? Yes. Correct. MashaAllah. All right. There's a reason I asked this question. And the reason is that, you know, we should not feel shy about our belief in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it is important that we are convinced of what we believe in. But in order for us to make sure whether the belief is correct or not, that's how we're going to go and basically uh, study this portion, the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his function. So three things. Number one, never feel shy and saying that we are followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay? And number two, be certain about your belief. And number three, make sure that the belief is correct. Okay? That's the, fi the final point is the most important point. That make sure the belief is correct. Now, in respect to our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yes, he is the final messenger. There is no messenger to come after him. Now this is something that uh, the community has began struggling with simply because there, are, there is a certain faction in our community who asserts otherwise. That no, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is, well he's the, the last messenger in terms of being the imam, but uh, there are messengers which can come after, after him which are subordinate to him. Just like in the, what's it called, the, the children of Israel. Okay, the, the Imam is Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, and all the prophets which came after him are subordinate to him. So this is an assertion that they make, and hence, uh, the, amongst the prophets which have come is Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, from the place called Qadian. Okay, and we might be giggling or laughing over this, but it's become a very serious movement, and a very aggressive movement, especially here in this, in this area of Mississauga and Brampton. It's become very aggressive. So, certain things are now uh, thrown at the community which people don't have any answers to. For example, look at this verse which is right there after the first point that the Prophet Muhammad is the final messenger to humanity. It says here, normally this, the verse that is quoted is, مَا مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is not the father of any one of you. And this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said because many people in the in the community were associating Zayd bin Haritha radiallahu anhu to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa because Zayd bin Haritha is the adopted son of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So instead of saying Zayd bin Haritha, they start saying Zayd bin Muhammad. Okay, so they're basically attaching his uh, lineage to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and this is something that Allah does not approve of. So he outright has condemned this by saying, Muhammad Muhammadun Aba Ahadim bin Jarikum. Muhammad sallallahu is not the father of any of you. Okay? Walakin. What however, what is he? Rasulullah wa khatam al nabiyin Okay, he is the messenger of Allah and he is the seal of prophethood. Now it is here this this word the seal of of prophethood where people start playing around with. The seal of prophethood does not necessarily mean that he is the final prophet. Okay, there are different interpretations and then they will go into the, the linguistics of it and so forth. But the way to defy all these arguments is who knows better about the implications of the Quran than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Is there anyone? Does anyone know the Quran better than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Yes or no? Okay. He is the messenger. He it has been revealed upon him. He is the one that's going to explain what the meanings are. And he himself, he explains this term Khatam and Nabiyyi. He says, according to one hadith to the near meaning, that his example is like the example of a structure which has been erected except for a portion of one brick. One brick is missing. 
And people come and they begin to marvel this structure, this, this house which has been made. However, they, they notice that there is a brick here which is missing. And in order to complete the beauty of this structure, you need to fill in that brick. That one last brick that is left. And the Prophet says to the near meaning that I am that last brick. Okay? And there is, I am the last Prophet, and there's no Prophet to come after me. Okay, so he himself explains what Khatam and Nabiyyi means. So there's no need for us to go and start looking for different interpretations and just to try and justify a claim that was made over a hundred years ago. So the Prophet Wasallam is the final messenger. Now, interestingly, he has also told us, he has warned us, according to another hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, Okay, the, the final hour will not be established until there are approximately 30 liars and uh, imposters which are sent. Okay, Dajjal means an imposter. Kadabun is not just a liar, he's an excessive liar. The Jaluna Kadabun, approximately 30 of them are going to be sent. Okay, and every single one of them is going to claim that I am the Messenger of Allah. Okay, so anyone who claims that he is a Messenger after Rasulullah, the Prophet has already told us that person's position. He's a Dajjal and a Kadab, he's an imposter and he's an excessive liar. Look, and it not it just accepts it. He's an extreme liar. So this is one hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari reported by Abu Huraira radiallahu an. We also have a similar hadith in Sahih Muslim as well. Okay, so this is an extremely important and it's one of the most fundamental aspects of our faith. No prophet is to come after Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Amongst his attributes and his qualities. I mean, Allah Himself, He tells us the nature of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That He has been, He is such that He grieves over what you suffer. He feels our pain. Okay, He, he is discomforted by other people's suffering. And if you notice that when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after he had his first encounter with Jibreel Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, was a very traumatic experience. He came back home extremely disturbed. And he was telling Khadija radiallahu anha, Zammiluni, Zammiluni, you cover me, wrap me. And after that, he expressed to Khadija radiallahu anha that he fears for his life. And Khadija radiallahu anha, being the wife she was, what was the first thing she did? She started enumerating the outstanding qualities of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. <laughs> It'll never be that Allah disgraces you. It can't, it won't be. And remember the Quraysh and everyone, they believed in Allah, okay, as a supreme deity. They just did not believe that, uh, that divinity is reserved for him, but divinity is extended to these 360 gods. That's a different story. But she made it very clear. There will never be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala disgraces you. And she started enumerating those qualities of his, how he would help the weak, earn for those, the destitutes, and so forth. And so the Prophet ﷺ was a person who cared sincerely about others. He wasn't a selfish person and he wasn't a person with an agenda that he was using people. No, he was a person that sincerely cared about people. So, and that's something Allah highlights. Grievous to him is what you suffer. And he is concerned over you and to the believers he is kind and merciful. So, harisuna alaykum, he is concerned, he is eager over your faith. And he is also merciful to the believers, and he is kind. And he has been sent as a mercy to all the worlds. And if you want to see an example of his mercy, now, say for example, we've been abused, whether it be verbally, whether it be physically, uh, for just two minutes. So a person came, say for example, I was walking in the mall, and a person came, and he stopped pushing me around, and start calling me Osama's brother and you terrorist and whatnot. It was going all out. And he was really, he was just waiting for me to react so he can deck me or he wants to punch me or whatever. And it happened for two minutes. Am I going to enjoy that experience? Yes or no? Is there anyone that would enjoy an experience like that? 
what would your sentiments be towards that individual? Positive or negative? And if you had the opportunity to get the upper hand, would you take advantage of it? Oh, definitely. Okay. Uh, and that's only a two-minute experience. Only two minutes, and this is what we feel like doing to that person. If I get the opportunity, I'll show them what I'm made of. Okay? When it comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, let alone two minutes, or two hours, or two days, or two weeks, or two months, or two years. For approximately 20 years, he was harassed by his own people. 20 years. Okay? They've conspired to kill him and assassinate him which had to force him to leave his hometown of 53 years and migrate to a new land, Medina to Munawra. And even after migrating, they're not leaving him alone. Okay? You have Badr, you have Uhud, you have Ahzab, war after war. And the wars are getting more intense and more bigger. They wanted to come to perform Umrah. Okay? And they have their own code and their own law that even their worst enemies, they will never ever stop them from performing pilgrimage. But when it comes to the Prophet and his, family, uh, and his followers, they were barred. No, you're not allowed in. Okay, and then they led to the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. You want to come? Okay, you come back next year. Go back. You're not welcome here right now. And when you come, you can only come for three days. Okay, and so forth. All these stipulations are being put. Now, finally, two years after the treaty, in the eighth year, when they made, they had violated one of the terms of the treaty, the Prophet ﷺ comes with an army of 10,000. The population of Makkah was only 2,000, so there's no way they could put up a fight. Okay? And they didn't even know what, what was coming up against them. They take over the entire city without incident, except for a few people that the Prophet ﷺ had given instructions that they're executed immediately. Okay, for other, for certain reasons, which you can talk about later, inshallah. But when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he ends up in Makkah now, what was his response? At that time, normally, if you understand Arab culture and the wars, you know, if one tribe gets their hands over the other, they would totally annihilate them, they would just finish them. And this is what the Meccans were expecting, that we're dead now. Okay, we're mincemeat now. And then the Prophet ﷺ, when he, after 20 years of abuse, keep this figure in your mind, 20 years, and highlight years, and underline it 10 times with 20 exclamation marks. 20 years of abuse. And now the Prophet ﷺ has got the upper hand. And what does he say to them? Do you know what I'm going to do to you today? And they're all now, you know, they're becoming all, you know, they're humbling themselves in front of the Prophet ﷺ and saying, Oh, you are a son and the son of a nobleman and so forth. I mean, until then he was a liar, he was a kadib, he was a sahir, he was majnoon, he was this, that, and the other. But today he's a nobleman. Okay, so they're becoming all kind with the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ says to them, that today I say to you what Yusuf alayhi salatu wasam said to his brothers, La tathriba alaykum al yawm, yaghfiru allahu lakum, wa huwa arhamu rahimin, idhabu fa antum al tulaqa. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasam says that there, be sure, there shall be no reproach upon you today, you're not going to be censured, you're not going to be held accountable for whatever it is you've done in the past 20 years of abuse. Yaghfiru allahu lakum, may Allah forgive you all. He is the most merciful of the merciful ones. And all of you go, you guys are all free. Because out of custom dictated that as soon as you take over another town, those people are now your slaves. Okay, so what does he tell them? Antum you guys are all free, go. So 20 years of abuse and this is how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responds. Mercy. Okay, and that's why he's known as Rahmatan bin He is the merciful the whole entire universe. SubhanAllah. So this is our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Finally wrap up before our break. We find his duties. His duties is, as Allah Himself says, Inna arsalna ka shahida wa mubashira wa nadira. He's a witness. He'll be a witness in his, in his own favor on the day of judgment. While other people will have to provide witnesses to pro prove their claims, our Prophet ﷺ is going to be given the privilege to stand as a witness to his own claims. And he's a bringer of good tidings, giving us the good news of Jannah, of Paradise, 
and he's also a warner, warning us from Jahannam. And he, and one who invites to Allah, da'yan in Allah bi idni, with Allah's permission. Wa sirajan munira, he's an illuminating lamp. The Prophet Sallallahu job is to take people out of the darknesses towards the light, the siratul mustaqim. The Prophet Sallallahu is the guide, okay? He is the lamp that we will hold on to in darkness. Because when you're in darkness, in order to get guidance and direction, you need some light. Today we have flashlights. In those days they had, they had the torches, okay? And lanterns. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's that illuminated lantern to take us out of the darknesses of kufr and shirk and disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, we also find that um, his duty is to convey whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent him. Bandih ma unzila ilayka min rabbik. He asked the Sahaba radiallahu anhu jma'in in Mina, in Hajjat al Wada, that Allah hal balagtu. Okay, this is his final Hajj. He, only, he passed away only a few months after this incident. He asked all the Sahaba radiallahu anhu jma'in, have I not conveyed the message? And they all testified, not only have you conveyed, you have fulfilled the trust that was given to you. Right? You have fulfilled the trust. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then looked upon to the sky and said, Allahumma shahad, Allahumma shahad, Allahumma shahad, oh Allah, you bear witness, oh Allah, you bear witness. So the Prophet sallallahu job and his mandate was to fully convey whatever has been given to him. He did not keep any secrets. Okay, and this is also another thing that certain factions of our community claim, that there are certain secrets which are not understood by the general public, and the only privileged individuals can get those secrets. Okay, and then this cult type of mentality is developed. Now, the Prophet ﷺ did not keep any secrets. If there were, say for example, the names of the Munafiqeen, he told Hudayfa radiallahu anh, okay, that these are the names of the Munafiqeen, approximately 15, 20 of them. Okay, that's not something that our faith is dependent on. Okay, things that the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told the Prophet also to convey, he has conveyed in full, which is going to lead to our salvation. So for us to come up with new ways to, find, to try and find salvation is really in, in an essence deviation. And finally, when it comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, his, his job is that he recites the book, he purifies us, from shirk and kufr, and he teaches the book and he teaches wisdom, okay, and things that we had no knowledge of. And finally, when it comes that the Prophet ﷺ, as I point out, was a humble human being. Those are very important points because he was not divine, okay. As some people assert that he was in essence a light and only in appearance a human being. And that's something that Rasulullah ﷺ himself has never claimed. There is a hadith which I'm going to share with you right now. Which this is the main hadith that many people cite. And this hadith has been found in um, Alama Zurqani rahmatullahi alayhi's uh, commentary on Mawahib al -Diniyah. So he he says that Abdul Razak, uh, Abdul Razak is a very famous muhaddith. He has a book called the Musannaf. He has a tafsir. Alhamdulillah, I have those collections and they're very beneficial. So, when I came across this hadith, one of the things is that, you know when they say always read the small prints? <laughs> if I read the small prints, it would have saved me a tremendous amount of time because when I saw this hadith, وَرَوَى عَبْدُ الرَّزَاقِ بِسَنَدِهِ عَنْ جَابِ بْنِ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ الْأَنْصَارِ that Abdul Razak has uh, reported with his own chain to Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari and I'm looking for this hadith, I'm scouring, I don't know how many hours I spent just looking and searching and searching, I couldn't find it. And then finally, when I looked at this and my eyes fell to, fell to the footnote, it says here, the mawdu'un la aslanahu, that number one, this hadith is fabricated and it has no foundation whatsoever, and it has been inappropriately associated to Abdul Razak. It's not found in any of his compilations. I said, why did I read that before? It would have saved me so much time, okay? So anyways, the hadith, which is a fabricated hadith, it, is, it says that Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu an, he went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, Ya Rasulullah bi abi anta wa ummi akhbirini ala awwali shayin khalaqahullahu ta'ala qabla al-ashya. That may my father and mother be sacrificed for you. Uh, tell me, 
What was the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created before he created all things? Okay, and according to the authentic hadith, the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created was the qalam, the pen. But according to this fabricated hadith, which is basically the foundation of this belief, which I just told you right now, it says, Ya Jabir, inna Allah ta'ala qad khalaqa qabla al-ashya nura nabiyyu. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before he created anything, he created the light of your prophet, nura nabiyyu. And then it gets very complicated, the narration. And sometimes when, when you have studied hadith for such a long time, you understand the style. And when there's something that doesn't, if that doesn't conform to that style, you automatically know there's something wrong before you even start checking the transmission chain. Just the style in itself, it, it's not right. It's just funny. So this is one of those weird styles. So it says here, So that, that light, it starts circumambulating with the, with the power of Allah wherever Allah wanted. And, and at that time, there was no such thing as time. There was no such thing as the safeguard of tablets. There was no such thing as the pen. There was no such thing as paradise. There was no such thing as hell. There was no angel. There was no sky. There was no earth. There was no sun. There was no moon. There was no jinn. There was no insan. And when Allah intended to create the creation, He He split, He divided that light into four portions. And from the first portion of that light, He had created the, the qalam. He had created the, the pen. Okay, and from the second portion of that light, he, he had created the safeguard of tablets, and from the third portion, he had created uh, the arsh, the throne, and from the fourth portion, he split that into four portions. Okay, and from the first portion of that fourth portion, he created the, the angels which carry the arsh, the second portion, he created the kursi, which is a step stool of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and from the third portion, he created all the angels. And the fourth portion, he then distributed that in four portions. Now, for the first portion of that portion, he created the skies, and then he created the earths. And the third portion, he created Jannah and Jahannam, the uh, paradise and hell. And the fourth portion, he then split that in four portions. Okay, and then that portion, it, for, through that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created the, the nur, the light, uh, of the uh, of the eyes of the believers and the nur in their hearts and that is the recognition of Allah and the nur of insan and that is tawheed la ilaha illa muhammad rasulullah and he says al hadith the hadith goes on so this is the pinnacle of that belief or I should say the foundation not the pinnacle this is the foundation of that belief and it's a fabricated hadith okay if it was really something that was true we'd find reference of it at least in the Quran or at least in the authentic teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in reality, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as you say here, as you see here, it says, Allah himself is instructing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ وَقُلْ سُبْحَانَ رَبِّي هَلْ كُنْتُ إِلَّا بَشَرَ الرَّسُولَ As I already cited, exalted is my Lord, was I ever but a human messenger. And now it is from this belief that we just pointed out that other beliefs are not associated with it. And that is like the Prophet ﷺ has absolute knowledge of the unseen. Absolute knowledge of the unseen is only reserved for Allah. Okay, and that's not something I'm saying based on personal opinion. Allah told the Prophet ﷺ, to say that, قُلْ لَا يَعْلَمُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ الْغَيْبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ You say, O Messenger of Allah ﷺ, no one knows the unseen in the skies and the earth except Allah. Okay, so what am I, who am I supposed to believe? Am I supposed to believe a lecturer or am I supposed to believe Allah? Allah Himself is made of black and white and crystal clear. And then He's also told the Prophet ﷺ to say, as we see in this verse, say, I hold not for myself the power of benefit or harm. I don't have the power to harm or benefit myself. Okay? If I really knew the unseen, I would have I could have accumulated much wealth. I know where all the treasures are. Just go dig them out and gather them. It's really easy because I know the unseen. So Allah Himself is saying is telling the Prophet ﷺ that this is the message you give. And no harm would have ever touched me. If the Prophet ﷺ knew what was coming on, he could easily avert it. If you know that harm is coming your way, what do you do? You take another way. You try and avoid it. Okay? 
I am not except a warner in ana inna nadiru wa bashiru ni qawmi yu'minun. I'm only a warner and a bringer of good tidings to a people who believe. So this is the nature of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as Allah himself has said in his own words. For us to go about and associating other things with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which he himself is not based on secrets, based on a special light or a vision. If it's based on a vision, my question would be, what is the difference between that person who's had this vision and Paul? You know the story of Paul and how the Trinity concept was introduced. If you don't, I'm going to tell you to go read it up. It was just a vision. Okay? And the vision, only Allah knows best the authenticity. We have a vision versus revelation. Okay? Revelation is what we're supposed to follow. So that being said, we pray to Allah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps our faith intact and keeps us guided inshallah and always remember be very careful of what you associate with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he himself has said man kadaba alayya muta'amidan fa yatabawak maqa'adahu min al-nar whoever lies about me intentionally he should occupy his seat and place in the fire and it is because of this one hadith many sahaba radiyallahu alayhi wa sallam were extremely reluctant and in actually reading a hadith they're very reluctant because of this one hadith that they might make a mistake and say something which was incorrect about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So inshallah we'll conclude with that. We'll have a five minute break inshallah and then we will continue class. A request inshallah if anyone sees any typos in the text please tell me because I just came across a couple myself. If you come across any just please tell us so we can rectify it and the next time when we publish this inshallah it's, it's better. Okay, so if you see any typos, please let us know about it. So now we're going to be talking about the day that we're all headed towards. This beautiful day that you see here. Okay? Right, perfect weather to go to Canada's Wonderland. Okay, enjoy yourself. Okay, so we're going to be talking, inshallah, about the final day. A day that we're all headed towards. So all of this that we are doing, the good deeds, the bad deeds, our performance, it's all going to be assessed on this day called the Day of Resurrection, Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the day when we are going to be made to rise and we're going to be made to stand, we're going to be taken out of our graves. Okay, so that day, it's real, it's true, it's not a fairy tale, it's not made up. And why do we believe it's real? Because Allah told us it's real. See, once you've established the faith in Allah, then you believe in everything that He has said. Okay? It's not like you're going to believe in some things and not believe in others. And this is something that the previous communities were struggling with. When it comes to the Quraysh, they just could not believe in this. That how can it be that once you're dead, you come back to life? People like Walid bin Mughira would go to the Prophet and they would get bones which are so old, they would crush it with their hands. And as you see in Surah Yasin, مَنْ يُحْيِي الْعِظَامَ اللَّهِ يَرَمِينَ Who is going to revive the bones? That's what they mean, they're made into mints and they're, they're done away with, they're dust. And Allah says, قُلْ يُحْيِي هَا الَّذِي أَنْشَأَهَا أَوَّلَ مَرَةً The one who made it the first time will make it the second time. And we all know for the for a fact to produce something originally is more difficult than reproducing that product. For Allah, nothing is difficult. Okay, so if he's made it once, he can make it again. And that's something that they were really struggling with. They just could not digest the the concept of the day of judgment, a life after death. But this is something that we believe, and this is something that we are working towards. Why do we believe it? Because he himself has told us. Allah tells us, he will surely assemble you for the day of resurrection, about which there is no doubt. There's going to be an assembly. But prior to that, there are going to be events, okay? Prior to that, we're going to have this entire system destroyed. Everything is going to come to an end, okay? It's a, just a system that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has adopted. He is going to bring everything to an end. And after that, he will, uh, a period of time is going to pass, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will resurrect everyone. Now, there are signs which are going to manifest leading to the final hour, leading to the final day. And this is something that fascinates most of us. 
Uh, for a lot of people, you know, we love talking about Dajjal and these conspiracy theories, when Imam Mahdi is going to come, the second coming of Isa, 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 it just fascinates us. Okay? Which in itself, I mean, I'm also fascinated by it in all, all honesty, but it's not the focus of what we're doing, that, oh, we have to straighten up because Dajjal is on his way. Okay, in Israel they've just done this, and you know these are the signs that, that are leading up. We've had the the two eclipses, and uh, you know th there's all these different things which are going on in the world. We're moving more more towards a one world government. You see the one eye symbol everywhere, and everyone loves talking about this: the Freemasons and the Knights Templars and whatever. Okay, so by us focusing on this, it's not going to really benefit us in any way if we. We don't even know if we're going to see this afternoon and we're worried about seeing the job. Okay? We're supposed to be worried about our appointment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we don't even, which we don't even know what it is. Okay? So this is what we're really supposed to be focused on. Yes, those signs are given to us as a wake-up call. <laughs> Look, it's coming. Get ready for it. So, the signs have been discussed in detail in the ahadith which inshallah we will get into in other sessions inshallah. But right now let's focus on the weather forecast of the final day. Okay, what is that day going to be like? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we had pointed out uh, in the previous lesson, He has angels which He has given certain responsibilities. One responsibility to a particular angel that He has given is to blow the horn. And that angel's name is Israfil, alayhi salatu wasalam. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he was absolutely, uh, you know, he he was really uncomfortable as soon as he was made aware that the angel has already put the horn in his mouth and he's just waiting for that command. Okay, he's just waiting for that command that you blow, and when he blows, this is what's going to happen. Okay, وَنُفِخَ فِي الصُّورِ فَصَعِقَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ Allah Himself is saying. And the horn will be blown, and whoever is in the heavens and whoever is on the earth will fall dead, except for, for whom Allah wills. Whoever, if there is anyone that's going to stay alive, that's totally up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when it comes to us in this world, every single person is going to perish. Nothing is going to remain in existence. Okay, so Allah is going to wipe everything out, and then after that, bring it back in a new form. Okay, so what what is going to happen? I mean, if you think the earthquake in Haiti and the tsunamis of 04 was really bad, well, look at this. Well, when the sun is wrapped up in darkness, I mean, sun is going to be put out, lights out. Okay, that's in it, that in itself is scary. Okay, the light light is put out, is wrapped up. The stars are going to start falling. Okay, we've seen shooting stars, and these stars are going to be more than shooting. Okay, they're going to be falling down on our heads. Okay, dispersing. And when the mountains are removed, okay, you're going to see mountains flying as if they are caught, and as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another verse. I mean, that in itself is it's totally scary. But that's that's what's going to happen on, the, on that day. And things that people give importance to, to the Arabs, it was like the full term she camel. Things that people give a tremendous amount of importance to, they're going to pay no attention to it anymore. So, like for them, a she camel, which is expecting, was something that they paid a lot of attention to. But even something like that, they don't, they can care less about it because you're going to be terrified of what's going on around you. So it's going to be total chaos. You'll find the skies are going to break, the stars are going to fall, the seas are going to erupt. Okay. And the graves are going to be scattered. The earth is going to shake. You're going to have an earthquake of tremendous proportions. Let alone forget 8.9 or 9.9 on the Richter scale. This is just going to break the Richter scale. Okay? So it's going to be a terrifying event. Okay? As Allah Himself tells. Okay? That the, the, the earthquake of the final hour is a terrible thing. You're going to see people as if they're going around, they're drunk or intoxicated, but in reality they're not intoxicated, they're bewildered. They don't know what to do. You know, you probably saw a glimpse of it. There was a movie that was released called 2012, and everyone now believes that 2012 is going to be the last day, December the 21st. <laughs> okay. Um, but now they're making movies of that. 
you can do it on your Windows Media Player as well. Okay, so basically, it's it's going to be a day where everything comes to an end and we have the whole weather forecast which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And it's not a joke. Okay, If we believe so much in 680 News that tomorrow is going to be a sunny day, you know, and we believe it, they're giving us a weather guarantee. Okay, $100 every day is put into the jackpot. And if we get it wrong, if we're off by three degrees, then you will win that jackpot. We have so much faith in what a man is saying. We have to have more faith. And it's only a prediction. This is fact. This is not a prediction. Okay, this is going to happen. Now just dwell on this. And this is enough to make you serious about your faith. You go home, just read these verses. And there's many other verses in the Quran. I'm only cited a, a few here. But this is enough to make us serious about what's up ahead of, uh, what's up against us. Now, this is after the first horn. So, Islafina alayhi salatu wasalam, he blows the horn, everything comes to him. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revives Israel alayhi salatu wasalam, he's told to blow the horn again and everything comes back to life. As Allah himself says, then it will be blown again. Okay? So we discuss events prior to the day, events on the day. The dead will be resurrected upon the sounding of the second horn. It will be blown again and one at once they will be standing looking on and that's when people are going to be absolutely terrified. Remember, the, the day of judgment is not going to be in the twilight zone. It's not going to be in another dimension. It's going to be right here. It's going to be on this earth. All that's going to happen, Allah subhanahu wa is going to exchange the earth for another earth. But it's going to be here. We're going to be taken out of our graves and we're going to be assembled in one place only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Where that place is, some people, some scholars say it's going to be in the plains of Arafat. Some people say it's going to be near Jerusalem. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Okay, wherever He assembles us, but He's going to assemble us and every single person to ever walk the face of this planet is going to be there. And it's something that we really need to be um, concerned about. Because if we are uncomfortable by developing a bad reputation in front of just a couple of people in a social circle, let's picture this, that on the day of judgment, we're going to be in front of the whole of humanity. Every single person is going to be there. And if on that day, one of our faults are exposed, it's not going to be pleasant. So we better be prepared and start preparing well for that day that nothing of ours is exposed. And you can just get that erased and delete it from your account by just doing Tawbah. It's simple as that. When we do Tawbah, when we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever sin we have committed is deleted. The delete button has been pressed. It's not there anymore. Okay? So it says, and the horn will be blown, and at once from the graves to their Lord they will hasten. They will say, Ya waydana, man ba'atana min marqadina. This is in Surah Yasin. You know, woe be to us, who, who woke us up from our resting places? Okay? This is what the Most Merciful had promised, and the messengers told the truth. They weren't making a lie, they weren't making this up. It's fact, we're seeing it with our own eyes. Okay? And then people are going to be gathered, and no one is going to be able to hide. Okay? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Himself is going to free Himself from all activities. He says in Surah Al-Rahman, كُلْنَ يَوْمٍ هُوَ فِي شَرْ Okay, that every day he is engaged in something, he's engaged in whatever. But on that day, سَنَفْرُهُ لَكُمْ أَيُّهَا الثَّقَلَانِ Allah is telling us that he's going to free himself for us, for you. Okay, all people of the two weights. And that's referring to the jinn and the insan. Okay, both jinn and insan, Allah is going to free himself just for us on that day. And that day, you know, when we go to a bank, if we're not doing online banking and we go to a bank physically and there's a line there, how frustrated do we get? Okay, we normally, normally when I go to the bank, I'm going to see IBC, I open the door, see the line and turn around and I walk out. I'm not going to wait there. Okay, and if I was to wait there, how long is the wait going to be? 15 minutes, 20 minutes? We have like five tellers there. Okay, so uh, clerks there. I mean, it's not going to be that long of a wait. On the day of judgment, does anyone have any idea how long that day is going to be? Sorry? 
50,000 years. Okay? Khamsina al fasana as Allah Himself says. 50,000 years that one day is going to be, 50,000 years of here. So it's not going to be a party. Okay? So, where the, everyone is going to be assembled, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Himself is going to free Himself, He will personally come forth. As you can see uh, in the second verse, Allah Himself he says, Your Lord has come. He Himself is going to come, and the angels rank upon rank. Okay, and uh, they, will uh, they will bear the throne of your Lord above them that day, eight of them. Okay, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al Haqqa. Okay, uh, so there's eight uh, angels which are going to be holding the throne and the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is beneath the shade of that throne the seven types of individuals are going to be accommodated to stay away from the sun which is only going to be one mile high okay above people's heads according to what the hadith has said so it's it's not a joke it's something that we have to become really serious about and make proper preparations for now we are going to some people are going to have the privilege to see Allah others are going to be barred from Allah Okay, when it comes to the believers, if we turn to the next page, it says here, There are certain faces which are going to be radiant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make the faces of the believers to shine. Okay, they will shine like the full moon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will illuminate their faces. And they will look upon Allah. They will have the opportunity to see the very Lord they have been worshipping and obeying and following His commands throughout their time in this world. They'll be able to see Him. Okay, and that's the, the biggest privilege that any individual could get. That you have the ability to see Allah. And He Himself is saying, okay, that we will be able to see Him. In this world, we can't see Him. But in the next world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show Himself as He sees fit. But when it comes to the non-believers, إِنَّهُمْ عَرَّبِّهِمْ يَوْمَ إِذِينَ لَمَحْجُوبُونَ They're going to be barred. They're going to be, uh, it says partition. They're going to be partitioned, but they're not going to have the ability to see Allah. And on that day, you know, whenever anyone important comes to a venue, everyone wants to be close to that person. Okay? Say, for example, uh, some, some movie star just came in. And he just released the latest uh, a movie, and uh, you know he's uh, he's just uh, become extremely famous because of his performance. Now everyone in the room, they all want to get close to him. Okay, they all want to get as uh, uh, try and impress him, and, and try and come in his good books because he's a part, person of importance. On that day, everyone is going to have that importance and multiplied by a thousand times for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. But only those people are going to be in the good books who actually performed well here. And those who didn't want to perform well, well, it's their tough luck. They brought this upon themselves. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to expose himself and only privileged people will see him. And we pray that's all of us, inshallah. Say inshallah. Okay. So paradise and hell will be brought forth. Presentation is going to be made. As Allah says in the Quran, so Jannah is going to be brought forth, it's going to be brought close. Jahannam is going to be exposed. And that is going to be a scene. And the way we find it positioned is that Jahannam is going to be before Jannah, and upon Jahannam is going to be a bridge known as a Sirat. And in order for a person to get into Jannah, he's going to have to cross that bridge. Once the accounting is done, okay, and then, then there's going to be two two hooks which are going to pick off people. Some people are going to fall. Some people are going to stagger. There's going to be different things that you're going. To, some people are going to cross with the speed of light, and they're going to say, hey, "Wait a second, in the world we heard about this bridge. Where is it?" And they're going to be told, "We just passed it." Okay, they're going to pass with the speed of light. Some people are going to spa, uh, pass it like a speeding horse, and so forth, as as the hadith have told us. So it's it's not going to be an easy day. Okay, so that, that presentation is going to be made. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And paradise will be brought near that day to the righteous, and hellfire will be brought forth for the 
deviators. Now, what is going to be the judgment process? There are going to be certain individuals who are going to be privileged to go to Jannah immediately. Okay, they don't have to wait. The doors are open, go in. Who are those people according to the hadith? They are those people that they are those people who have full reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They, they do not engage in these different types of actions where their, their, their tawakkul has, di, has diverted from Allah and to amulets or omens or something of that nature. They don't engage in those type of actions. According to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told us, they are those people who have full reliance on Allah. 70,000 of them go straight into paradise. There are going to be certain people who are going to be thrown headlong into hell immediately. And then the remainder, they're going to have their judgment done. Okay? How is the judgment going to be done? Well, there is no standard. When we look throughout the Quran, we find that people are going to be tr treated different. Some people are going to be told, Read your book yourself. Today, you yourself are sufficient to take your account. And you yourself can decide where you, where you need to go. Other people, their their deeds are literally going to be weighed on the scale. Okay? So what you have is the scale of deeds is going to be presented. And you have uh, the verses. It's going to be a scale of justice. Okay? No one is going to be shortchanged. And no one is going to be oppressed on that day. Now... The good deeds and bad deeds are literally going to be weighed. And it is based on what outweighs the other that the final decision is going to be made. If the scale of the good deeds outweighs the bad deeds and the person knows where he's going, he's going straight to Jannah. If not, then he's in trouble. Then he is, he is uh, basically left to Allah. Allah can forgive him if he wants, or Allah can punish him if he wants. That is totally up to Allah. Never be judgmental of anyone that, oh, this person is going to hell, not over the night. You hear people say this. Okay? Some people who develop extreme sentiments. The person didn't read his salah according to this particular fiqh, he's going to go straight to hell. Okay? I mean, degrade people. Who are we to grade anyone except ourselves? Grade yourself with anyone. Don't be judgmental of others. Be worried about yourself. So, that being said, people are going to be. Um, they're, they're going to be reckoned on the Day of Judgment in this manner that you see in front of you. And remember, no deed is going to be unnoticed by Allah, even if it's the size of an atom's weight. And an atom's weight, we don't even, it doesn't even weigh anything. Okay, But if it's as minute as that, even that is going to be put on the scale. So every deed counts. Why is it that everyone is going to be running away from each other on that day? Person is going to be running away from his brother, his parents, his wife, his children. Why? Because they don't want to be, uh, they don't want to encounter any of their family members who will ask for some change. Okay, you know, you have panhandlers. You know, whenever you're uh, by, okay, <laughs> I don't know what that signifies. Okay, but you have panhandlers. As soon as you're at a traffic light, they're coming with their Tim Hortons empty coffee cup. Okay, they're asking you for some change. Well, on the day of judgment, the change that everyone's going to need is good deeds. Okay, they're going to need a'mal. And that's why everyone's running away from each other because they don't want to give those deeds. They don't want to give those a'mal. Okay, and finally, when it comes to Allah, as I've said, He is prepared to forgive everything on that day except for shit. If anyone has died with shirk in their account, has died with disbelief in their account, which they did not repent from in this world, Allah is not prepared to forgive them. Yeah, if a person committed shirk in this world, and then he did tawbah, and then he asked Allah for, subhanahu for forgiveness, and then he went on the surat al mustaqim that person is forgiven. I mean, all the, basically, you can say the majority of the sahaba, of the Allah, were like that. They were all mushrikeen first. Okay, then they've repented, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has accepted them and made them models for the, for the Muslim community. So if a person has repented from it in this world, it's all well and good. But if he has not repented and he has gone back to Allah with that in his account, he's in trouble. Allah has made it very clear. He'll forgive everything, but that's one thing he's not going to forgive. And that's something that we need to refrain from it and understand exactly what is termed as shirk in order for us to refrain from it. 
And that's why we dwell so much on Tawheed. That if our faith is not in line with that and we're doing other things, we're going and getting into trouble. Okay? So that's basically what do you call it? So what we aim to do is we want to have a good account on that day and we want to go straight to Jannah inshallah and enjoy ourselves for the rest of the eternity but it's going to require some effort and the effort starts now. It doesn't start when my back is bent and my hair is gray and I need the support of a king. It does not start 10 years from now because I want to enjoy myself for now. It doesn't start after I go for Hajj and then I will become pious. It starts now because you don't even know if you're going to see the next 10 minutes let alone the next 10 years. So, inshallah, saying that, we will conclude. May Allah give us ability to understand. Inshallah, I'm going to give, inshallah, five minutes for the Q&A session because we have to clear the area. There's going to be a class here, inshallah, that's starting at 11 o'clock. The, the teachers last week did request that everything is set up by 11. We don't start setting up at 11. So first I'm going to take uh, questions from the sisters. It says, where can we get good workbooks from? Well, you can Google this online. There are certain people who are selling them here. There's a person in Scarborough that I know. Ta'alim uh, islam I think that's on Weston. They also sell uh, some of those books. You can Google this online, inshallah. What are some practical steps we can take to develop that love for Allah, the prophets, and Islam? Well, number one is exposure. Okay, you will only love something based on the amount of exposure you give yourself to it. And when we say exposure, that means talking about it, reading about it, discussing it. I mean, when we go uh, and say, for example, in England, soccer is a religion, literally. Okay, those of us who have been to England, <laughs> I'm Zaleen, you know, okay, soccer is literally a religion. And certain soccer players are considered gods, literally. They're considered gods. And all they talk about in their, in their, what do you call it, social gatherings while they're in the pub is nothing but stats of this player and that player. When you keep on talking about something, you automatically develop the love. Even if you don't know anything about it, eventually when you get continuous exposure to it, you get a liking for it. Right? First, when, when I was there, I used to hate soccer with a passion. But now it's something that everyone does. And slowly you start playing it, then you get involved. So you're talking about Man United, or you're talking about Newcastle, or Chelsea, or whatever. You're getting involved because everyone else is doing it. So it's all about exposure. That's why Allah tells us, Kunu ma'asad, you can be with the truthful people. Develop good company. Develop the company of the pious. Okay? And whatever good values they have, it will slowly come upon you as well. And we find that in the hadith as well. The Prophet also gives the example of a person who's selling perfume, and a person who is a, uh, a blacksmith. Okay? On the day of judgment, since everyone will be in disarray, will it really matter if our sins will be revealed? Well, once the reckoning starts, <laughs> yeah, of course. It's prior to that everyone is going to be in a state of disarray because as the hadith says, Allah is, Allah is going to be so angry on that day, He's never been angry this much before and this, this much angry after. Okay, and people are going to be totally frightened, but when it comes to the, the reckoning starting, I mean, you don't want your ne the person next door to know what you did in, in isolation in your room, what, what you were viewing over the internet. You don't want them to know, because if they know, then all of a sudden it's going to reflect very badly on your reputation. So even if one person knows, that's, it's not something that is very, uh, it's taken very comfortably by us. So, and at the end of the day, we're not doing anything for people, we're doing everything for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but this is just something that we want to be aware of. Uh, any other questions, inshallah? Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, can you repeat that again? Uh huh. In what terms? Well, Allah, basically, Allah only knows best exactly the magnitude of each sin. And remember, not each sin is same. There's grades in sins as well. If you collect all the hadith, the major sins are 42. Okay, some, in some hadith, the Prophet also says it's 7, some would say it's 9, but when you collect all of them, you add them all up, it comes to 41, 42. So there are some which are really major, some which are really minor. Same thing when it comes to good deeds. There are some good deeds which are you know, far excellent than others. The Prophet himself has said that Al Imam Bid'a Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala 
فأبدله قول لا إله إلا الله وأدناها إماتة الأذى عن الطريق. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم says that um, the iman has been divided in 70 different branches, over 70 branches. The most virtuous of it is the declaration and the statement of saying la ilaha illallah. Okay, and the, and the most minute is to remove something harmful from the pathway. So they have grades. Okay, so if you're comparing a major sin to a minor good deed, obviously there is no comparison here. Like shirk to removing something away from the road. So the magnitude of each good deed and bad deed it varies. Someone is yes or so. That's a very good question. Because this is a something that many people are confused by and it's a word that's used very loosely. So shirk really is defined by number one, you are creating partners in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divinity. The divinity is only reserved for Allah. He is the only God. Now to start claiming that other people are God and giving them a share of that, that's one form of shirk. Number two, another form of shirk is that a person, he is now associating the exclusive attributes of Allah to humans. Okay, that just like that only Allah is capable of doing this, but now he is saying that this man can also do that. Number three, another form of shirk is that you're taking a person up as an authority and a representative of Allah. And basically he's, the, he's got the authority to override any rules which are found in the scriptures. As we see, this is what happens in the Catholic system. The Pope, he is the voice. And he has the authority of making new laws or abrogating old laws. He's got the authority. And this is what is called shirk. Uh, uh, Hatim Ta'i's uh, son, what was his son's name? Adil, Adil ibn Hatim. When he came across this verse in the Quran that, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, Aqul Ya Ahl al-Kitab ta'ala wila kalimati sawa'in bayna wa baynakum anna na'abida ila Allah wa la nushrika bihi shay'a wa la yattakhida ba'aduna 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 min dhuni la. That we're not going to take up uh, certain people as gods other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he told about, we don't take up our leaders as gods. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to them, meaning that when they declare something to be halal, do not take it as halal. And when they declare something to be haram, do not take it as haram. Basically, they're making the law. And legislation, in al-hukmu illa lillah. It's only for Allah. No one has divine authority. That is only for Allah. And we see that very same type of um, uh, system, which is also crept up in our own Muslim community, certain factions of it that you have an imam, and that imam is a sign of Allah, and he is the authority, okay, regardless of what the Quran says. So that's another form of shirk, okay? Yes? No, because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already decided he's going to Jannah, then obviously they're going to be overlooked, right? they'll be deleted. And there are certain uh, verses which indicate that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even in, in uh, one hadith <laughs> the Prophet sallallahu he laughed over this that there's going to be a time when a person is going to come and his minor, de minor misdeeds are going to be shown to him. And obviously he's going to be dreading. <laughs> you know, I've committed this felony, this offense, this misdeme misdemeanor. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of His grace, Allah will convert those evil deeds into good deeds. And He's gonna be, He's gonna be so taken by that that He's gonna say, His major, His major sins haven't been shown. So He's gonna say, well, there's a lot of other sins I can't see around here, which I committed. Okay, and He's referring to the major sins that He committed. So He's wanting them to be converted as well. So Allah can convert those bad deeds into good deeds. This is Allah's mercy. Okay, yes. In terms of the direct, yeah, Musa was listening to the word of Allah. Allah was talking to him. Yeah, there's no indication that it was just something that was going on in his mind. 
if it was a voice that he approached that uh, that tree, which apparently looked like it was on fire, but in reality it was light, and then he heard the voice. If it wasn't something that he was he was uh, it was going on in his mind, literally he heard it externally. Okay. Some other you had a question. This will be the last question, and then we have to wrap up, inshallah. Now in Arabic, and you have these, uh, you know, just like we say in English, you know, thousands of people did this, or millions of people did this. I told you a billion times. That's that's just a metaphor. Okay, that it means I told you a lot of times. Now that has been interpreted both ways in the Hadith. Some people have taken the literal sense, and some people have claimed this a metaphor. But Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows best because the word seventy is used the way we use billion or a thousand as a metaphor in Arabic. 